This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, hosts Civil War reenactments, ATV rodeos, mud bogs, diesel truck pulls, and high school rodeo finals. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and we're delighted to have two people who work as staff members, titles sometimes different, but staff members in the House of Delegates, Mike Bolefsky, who's working with Delegate Tom Rust, and Marty Hall, working with Delegate Will Moorfield. Mm -hmm. And appreciate you two gentlemen being on the program this week. Uh, sometime in the past year, we had some of your counterparts, some of the women who are members mm -hmm. of the staff, and we wanted to invite you all and have you help uh, inform and educate the viewers about uh, what's the best, some of the best ways for them to contact legislators. Maybe that's a good place where we could start. We're now into the session, but you might also comment while you're doing it about what's the best way even when they're not in the session. So uh, Marty, let me start with you. What's the, what's the best way if someone's trying to reach your delegate or other members of the House? The best way with us would be email and get someone from the district that we represent to send a letter or email or whatever because uh, we really respond to people in our district first and then other people come second. And of course, you can always come by the office or give us a phone call. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned about getting someone in the district because uh, I've heard over the years that it's that's so important and, and some of us even encourage people to put that almost in the title line of the you know, I, I live at such and such I'm one of your constituents because they get overwhelmed with email. Mike what would you add to the discussion? Well uh, Delegate Russ has a you know, full-time office in which actually in Herndon actually people come there in person to come and see the staff there. Uh, we have a full-time staff member Carol Sinclair that's there all the time and she works with me now during this session. I'm here in Richmond as the Richmond aide to Delegate Rust. And we also can uh, phone us. There's no problem phoning and also email. Also, we have a Facebook account, a Twitter account. So we do get some information, back, feedback from the uh, constituents concerning their, con their needs and concerns. Now, I know that some of the legislators and probably it's their staff who help them on that send out kind of a newsletter type communication mm -hmm. to people on the list. Do, do your legislators do that? Uh, Delegate Moorfield sends out a weekly email to a couple thousand people on his list and then he does a newspaper article and he actually does those articles himself. Oh, yes. he, he wants to make sure to get the correct information out and he wants to make sure he puts it in his own words for his constituents so he actually does that himself. Same, same thing with Delegate Russ. He actually um, corresponds uh, by email and personally writes the emails by himself and we communicate to the uh, constituent concerning that. We also have the uh, Tom Rust uh, Richmond report that uh, we, he does every week that's uh, sent out to uh, his email constituents on Friday and then when we're out of session he has it once a month. You know, one thing that we could encourage viewers to do because they may not be in either of your delegates districts to contact their delegate and their senator and say, I'd like to be on your, your list. I'm one of your constituents. That's probably how most of them got on there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so if someone 
listening to this and watching this discussion says, I don't get anything like that from my delegate. It's probably, or my senator, it's probably because you're not on their list and, and they're, they're delighted to put you on the list. It's One thing I'd like you to remind your viewers is that uh, when you get these form email le uh, responses, um, we can tell that they come in uh, hundreds or two hundreds. We can tell that they're done by a, a group. And I would advise your um, people who are listening to this show to make it more personal when they respond to the delegate or the senator rather than a form email. Yeah. Uh, the Sometimes it's easy for people to do the form email, but they don't realize that it, that doesn't carry the same value. Yes. It, it, it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, what, what else would you want to tell them about uh, some other ways for them to be informed during the session about how things are going? Well, one thing is how your TV show uh, that you do on Friday nights. Uh, in Southwest Virginia, uh, a lot of people watch that because you give them up-to-date information from each delegate and like today's staff members and they're able to see you and know who you are and everything and I, I think by the way you come out in the community like the way you come to Galax and different places people are familiar with you and they feel like uh, they've got a connection because they've seen you in public and things like that but in Southwest Virginia your show does a lot of good plus you know you can always uh, get on our website and we'll update you as far as Delegate Moorefield's concerned plus he's out in the community all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different in Northern Virginia primarily uh, Delegate Rust had uh, two town hall meetings on Saturday uh, in different parts of his legislative district so uh, we communicated to the constituents that we were going to have a two town meetings and also we have a teletown hall coming up on this Wednesday in which you can call in and ask specific information as to legislation goes and also their concerns. Yeah, so that's it, another way of communicating. Yeah, I think a significant number of legislators now in contrast say to five years ago or ten years ago are using uh, using all kinds of social media, some that you mm -hmm. mentioned are using teletown halls and, and ways of, of trying to communicate. Uh, mm -hmm. Over the weekend, I received an email from my senator and saying, here's a survey if you want to respond to the survey to yeah. try to, where the senator would be seeking to find out where constituents stand. So mm -hmm. they, it's a challenge for them, I'm sure, because the session is so short mm -hmm. and they want to be able to go back to the districts uh, and, and having voted in a way that, that they feel best represents their district. And we have a lot of visitors coming from Northern Virginia to see uh, uh, Tom Rust in his office and anybody uh, from his district in any part or even of oh, Virginia can visit their delegate when set, uh, they're in session at, in Richmond. You know, let me, let me pick up on that point and I'll get Marty's perspective okay. on it too, that um, it's a challenge during the session to get to see one's legislator because they probably have two places they need to be, Four one three. to present <laughs> present a bill, another place right. where they're serving on a committee. And oftentimes they are fortunate to get to see the the staff to the to the legislator. And you know, I would encourage them to think that they're getting top level help when they mm -hmm. when they can do that. And and not to feel that, well, my my delegate or my senator is not available. It's just that things move at such a fast pace that it's, it's, it's extremely difficult for legislators. And also we know where exactly the legislature is located. That's one of our top priorities is where is your uh, state legislator at the appropriate time. So we can guide them. He's at a subcommittee meeting on the fifth floor. He's at a, a committee meeting or on the, in the room number in the beginning of the General Assembly building or he's on the House floor. So we can guide uh, the constituent as to where he's he or she's located. How, how does that work in your office or with you? Whenever someone comes to our office, uh, we get them to sign in and they get to talk to either me or the delegate one. And uh, most of the time it's the delegate, he's usually there. And uh, we're out in Richmond at night at different receptions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Southwest Virginia has a big reception. We get to see about a thousand people at that. So we get to see about everybody from home that comes in, plus 
any lobbyists or people like that that want to come in and ask us about a bill or something. Delegate Moore feels you can get a hold of him most any time he's around every place. So, same thing. And I think that while you two primarily represent your delegates, uh, you're two among the nearly 200 people who are chiefs of staff, legislative assistants, policy directors, there's some variety of names mm -hmm. that are used, but who would probably say the same thing about their legislator, that they're, they're accessible yes. and they, they want to be accessible, particularly to their constituents. Mm -hmm. Because if, uh, uh, if they're just trying to visit all the legislators and they're not their constituents, I mean, they're not from the district, then their input doesn't doesn't really count as much. So, uh, Mike, any other closing thoughts that you would you would have about what you've seen? That we've talked about some of the best things to do. Anything you'd warn people about? Some of the the, the worst things that you that could happen when they're trying to communicate with the legislator. Well, primarily there are certain days of the uh, session that a lot of uh, public citizens are do come and visit us and. Uh, that's especially true on uh, Martin Luther King Day and whether, you know, it's very, very busy down here and also at the beginning of the session. So uh, things slow down a lot at, at the end when the bills are passed by the House and then sent over to the Senate and the Senate passes their bills and put over to the House. So there are certain times of the session where the uh, cons uh, legislator is more of quite readily available. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Marty, any, any closing thoughts you'd have about uh, any things that people ought to avoid? or? Well, the best way to get in touch with us is through email. Because Delegate Moorefield, we run the emails off on the copier, give them to him. He tells what his response wants to be. He sees each and every one of them. Plus, we have so many appointments each day because he tries to see everybody that wants to see him. So if you come down and you only get like five minutes with him, it's because everybody else is getting five minutes also. Right. Well, thank you very much, Marty Hall, Mike Bolefsky. Thank you. Pleasure uh, to meet you. Representing not just your offices, but representing the other 138 offices and nearly 200 people who are legislative staff. Appreciate your being thank on you. very much. Thank you very much, David. I'd like to welcome our viewers back to This Week in Richmond, and we have two colonels with us. There's any number of members of the General Assembly who've served in the military. You two uh, served and are retired at the rank of colonels in the Air Force and in the Army. Marines. 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 Be careful there. Oh, Be careful. Uh, that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> A plug for the Marines. But, but, but more than that, you're, you're citizen legislators working on a number of issues that relate to not only to veterans, but to your constituents and other people in the Commonwealth. So, so much pleased to be here. Delegate Mark Dudenheffer from Stafford, also representing a portion of Stafford and Prince William. Mm -hmm. Delegate Rich Anderson representing a portion of Prince William. Right. So, uh, you're welcome to ignore me and have a conversation between the two of you about what are we some do of quite often. About we, we, we rent a house together. So <laughs> we're yeah. roommates. So yeah. we, we see probably too much of each yes. other. Is and they put one delegate between you and your offices upstairs <laughs> right. on, on the fourth floor. So. Yeah. But what are some of the issues that you'd want to inform our viewers on that are you think are some of the critical issues that, for this session? Rich? Well, I, uh, uh, there's a whole gamut of issues that are confronting the General Assembly, uh, offered by members of both sides of the aisle. So it's the short session, as we all know. Right. So therefore, it'll be um, invigorating in order to get through a very busy agenda of issues. Uh, for myself, um, I sit as chairman of the Military and Veterans Caucus in the General Assembly. Mark is a very faithful member of, of that body uh, since he first walked in the door. Um, one of the bills that I'm carrying is with Senator Toddy Puller, and that is to um, um, invigorate what's called the Virginia's Veterans Values Program, V3 for short. It's something that the uh, Department of Veterans Services here in the Commonwealth has started doing. This codifies it, puts it in the code. The governor's been good to uh, fund it over the last two fiscal years, and now we're gonna make mm. it part of the Virginia code. Uh, 
with uh, Kirk Cox, uh, Majority Leader Cox of Colonial Heights, we are together uh, patroning a bill to start work on another Virginia Veterans Center, Virginia mm. Veterans Care Center. This one will be in Northern Virginia, which I think, Mark and I think that's a, a great venue. But uh, we're going to start the work on that, and it will join uh, mm. our network of Virginia Veterans Care Centers here in the Commonwealth. Excellent. We look, at, you know, on this veterans, um, looking at veterans issue, it's, you know, it spreads across a very large gamut of different types of issues that affect our veterans who deserve and need our help in many ways. Um, I've got a piece of legislation that identified a hole in the ability for active duty military members in the state of Virginia to get uh, in-state tuition, which has been, I think, our goal for quite some time in this one little little area. So, you know, as far as veterans go, we're always looking for an opportunity to to identify and plug plug those holes, as as I call them, but um, to make them uh, to make the Commonwealth more veteran friendly. You know, we want to we have a very high percentage of veterans here, and they deserve everything that we give to them for the service that they've given to their country. What, what about uh, stay on stay on the, and talk about some other issues you're working on, then we'll come back to to Rich. What are some of the other bills? Um, I, I'm working on some legislation that. Um, looks at the ability of schools to respond to specific um, types of, of problems with, with the students. In this case, it has to do with cardiovascular type um, problems. We had a young, young girl, very beautiful young girl, who passed away in Stafford County this past year on the last day of school by having heart failure on the school grounds. And through a, a, a combination of, of inexperience and lack of training, um, the care that she needed to revive her and to provide her with the services she needed to, to come back to us weren't available. And uh, their family, very active, they're, they're, they're close friends of mine and they're hurt. And we're pushing to improve the, the CPR training amongst not only teachers and staff members, but also to invigorate the student training, which is part of the SOLs uh, at this point. So it's it's a very aggressive piece of legislation. I'm hoping that we can um, we can push it forward. It's being um, sponsored and, and supported by the American Heart Association, and uh, it it it's very important to me. I I, I know what these parents are going through. We don't. We need to do everything we can to make sure parents don't lose their child. Um, children go off to school; they should come home. Uh, it's a horrible thing to uh, live through that. I have done that, and it's just not. It's not something you should ever have to deal with as a parent. Probably most parents, or even grandparents, would think that that sort of training had already occurred. So you're you're addressing well, I, something that doesn't occur everywhere. Well, and I and I I've talked to a number of of constituents, and when you say, do you you know do you know that your your teachers aren't CPR certified? They're flabbergasted. I think the rule now or the regulation requires two CPR certified staff members for what a thousand more kids, and. I think uh, the, the populace believes that there is that level of care and that level of training, and it's not there. And uh, we need to provide that. Okay, Rich, what what are some of other matters that you're working on? Well, some other things of interest to me beyond uh, veterans issues, um, I'm carrying a bill um, with Senator George Barker, and in fact, there are several bills like this in play right now, but. It uh, addresses the problem of texting while driving. Uh, I carried a bill last year which didn't survive the legislative process, so I'm going to go back in, this time with uh, Senator Barker as my partner. What we're trying to do is uh, put real teeth into the texting while driving laws. Today they don't carry a significant penalty, and it's a, it has been a difficult provision in Virginia code to enforce. So what we're seeking is, is a change that bans texting while driving. It virtually borders on driving while intoxicated, um, and it's a very rear, real and present danger 
for individuals on Virginia's highways and roads. So we're going to carry a piece of legislation about that. It takes it from a secondary offense to a primary offense and then also has some fairly substantial but not unreasonable penalties, $250 for the first offense, $500 for each offense thereafter. And so I'm carrying that with him. Uh, at least in my district at home in Prince William County, there is significant sentiment about addressing and resolving this after having finally talked about it for quite an extended period of time. Um, uh, it's a problem in other states too. I hear that from my fellow legislators from other states who I serve with in the National Conference of State Legislatures. So we've definitely got to address this one. Viewers may be interested in why would someone oppose legislation such as that uh, because some of them may be watching it and saying even as the issue that you raised you now this one that seems kind of like a common sense matter so uh, uh, help our viewers understand maybe why people oppose and maybe they need to be well, contacting for, their legislators. Actually it's for, for pretty uh, understandable and reasonable reasons uh, and it's simply this that uh, it is so difficult when you put a new provision in the code this is one of the very first things I learned when I came in here and put it into the code in such a way that it doesn't create additional problems. Um, the, the advice I got when I came here is don't be guilty of passing uh, a law of unintended consequences. And so it's very difficult to navigate through this. In fact, this is one of the hardest things I've done in my life is to be able to um, legislate in an intelligent way that's reasonable um, and to navigate it through the process. So for uh, reasonable reasons, it's, it's been opposed in the past for reasons of technicalities, but I see a way ahead. I've worked with uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures to ensure that uh, this has uh, been successful in other states. It's worked well, it's been modeled elsewhere. So uh, we have a number of those bills in play right now in the General Assembly, probably a half dozen. Uh, at some point, I imagine you'll see uh, those rolled together in some sort of reasonable um, fashion so that we can pass it this year. I'm not interested in, in getting the credit. I'm interested in protecting the citizens of Virginia, and this is a threat. And, and, and to, to carry on the thought that uh, Rich gave here is people are concerned about the cumulative effect also, especially when it comes to schools. I mean, we already provide a number of mandates for, for teachers and, and things that they need to do. So, you know, we always have to be thoughtful on what we require from, from our teaching staff, from the bus drivers, from all, our, all the aspects of uh, the legislation that we put in. So I think one of the first reactions that I get on my, my legislation I was talking about is, is uh oh, here's another mandate on teachers. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a valid it's a valid argument, as, as Rich says, but you, you know, we, I think we have to take the higher road on some of these things. And always, almost everything we deal with, someone's going to raise the issue of how much is that going to cost us to do that. So mm -hmm. in, a, in an environment where budgets are tight and, you know, and, and uh, a lot of new revenue isn't out there, whenever you create something that creates a, could potentially create a cost, it raises uh, raises eyebrows from the appropriators and, and mm -hmm. for everyone there. So there are, there are legitimate reasons for, I think, why things don't, don't pass, but in the end, you know, I think the good legislation and the good things that we try and do do get through. And mm -hmm. the process is meant to be somewhat arduous, I think, because mm -hmm. that way we're forced to think through everything we're doing. We're, you know, other people bring in ideas and, and, and we, are, we debate back and forth. That's, that's part of the process to come up with good legislation that holds the test of time, that mm -hmm. makes it through the courts, like the, with the, the traffic. I mean, Rich could tell you some stories of some cases where these texting laws have been applied in a in totally unintended way that, that they were passed in the past. So we have to be thoughtful of all those. We have to go through this sometimes crazy process to get to the good legislation. A closing minute. Was there some other issue that either of you wanted to, to mention to our viewers? Uh, I suppose is something I consider to be very important is uh, I'm carrying on behalf of uh, a school board member in Prince William County 
whose son had a severe concussion and mm. unfortunately took his own life approximately two years ago. Um, he asked me if I would carry a piece of model legislation that had been done in another state. I've got that in and I was surprised. I thought it would be a relatively mundane issue. I've had literally an avalanche of folks call me, want to know how they can help. This is a very real problem out there and I look forward to being part of that discussion. And certainly, for the next five weeks, we are going to be up to oh, our yes. ears in yes. transportation and trying to figure ways to fix transportation. Mm -hmm. Rich and I are both from Northern Virginia. I sit in that traffic every day. And the millions of man hours lost every year, people just sitting in traffic, we have to do something about that. Appreciate both of you being on This Week in Richmond. We look Thanks forward to having, having another conversation maybe after the session is ended. Right. Okay, sounds Thank good. You. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Alpha Natural Resources, an energy company dedicated to respecting the land. Alpha Natural Resources, we power the world through the energy of our people. Everywhere there are lighting poles, there's one more opportunity to save money. Intelligent Illuminations provides cost-effective wireless lighting solutions for roadway or area outdoor lights. Kanawha Valley Arena, Virginia's cowboy town, Host Civil War reenactments, ATV rodeos, mud bogs, diesel truck pulls, and high school rodeo finals. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.